One God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of our lives. Amen. Part of the tension in today's text is this, this tension between the, the kingdom of the emperor, or the empire, and the kingdom of God. Right? The empire and the kingdom of God. Um, and this was a part of... I mean, it, it, Jews, the early Israelites wrestled with this. Jesus is making a comment on it. And we ourselves in today's world actually actually wrestle with this as well. So I want to talk about all those things. Part of what it meant to be an Israelite, part of what it meant to be uh, a descendant of Abraham is that God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. And then God calls God's people out of their bondage and out of their slavery into this promised land. And so part of, and, and, and they developed practices that set them apart from other people. Um, so they had, you know, cleansings, ritual cleansings, and they ate certain kinds of foods. Their food dietary practices were different than the people around them, and their worship practices developed to be different around them, and they took a Sabbath uh, that was different from the days of the people around them. And so part of what it meant to be a follower of God, it permeated your whole life, but your whole life was, was focused on these things that set you apart from other people these things that set you apart from the world around you. Um, and so, you know, what it is, is it, is it you're a unique nation, everybody around you uh, follows the same religious practices, um, and uh, so what it meant to ultimately love your neighbor is your neighbor was somebody who believed like you did. Your neighbor was somebody who lived like you did. Your, your neighbor was somebody who had the same religious practices that you did. And so to love your neighbor was to love somebody who actually was a lot like yourself, um, quite honestly. The, and it, it sets up this situation where your whole life, there's a, sac- there's a sacredness to your whole life because your whole life is devoted to righteousness in every aspect of your life, right? It gets down to your, your bodily functions in, in Jewish religious practices, get down to your, your, your menstruation, right? And nocturnal emission. And you know, like it gets down to your, your just how to all the way down to you know, your body and then what kind of houses you live in, what kind of clothes you wear, um, you know, whether you have a cap, what do you wear on your head, uh, the, then the kind of prayers you say. So there's a, there's a sacrality to your whole life, but there's a sense that your whole life is devoted to God, unlike those other people who follow idolatry and paganism. And so we're set apart. And so for, in that context, in the temple, when Jesus is teeping in the temple, when Israel is occupied by Rome, they have to pay a tax to Rome, right? They're, uh, they're obligated. And, um, you know, Jewish coins, there were Jewish coins, shekels, there were Jewish weights to do trade. But to pay the empire's tax, you had to use a Roman coin the denarius, and on the Roman coin was the emperor's head, so it was a graven image. Like, there was this rule against having graven images in, you know, the first, in the uh, Ten Commandments, so there's a graven image of the emperor, Tiberius, and then there's a title, and the title says um, that Tiberius is the son of a god. Augustus, his father was declared a god, right? And so here, Tiberius is the son of a god. So it's not just an economic claim. This isn't just about money on this coin. There's a deeply religious claim that's being made on this coin. And if you're a people who think you're set apart, and if you're a people who want to be holy, to have this kind of pagan, idolatrous thing in your midst is to introduce unholy, I mean, something that's unrighteous, something that's unclean into your midst, right? And that bothered the Jewish people. That bothered the Israelites. Like, like they, they, for them, they, you know, they didn't, <laughs> um, they chafed at that, right? And so when Jesus says, they're trying to, so when the Pharisees and the Herodians are trying to trap Jesus, they, they think they're putting him in a bind by saying, well, if you affirm that we have to pay the, 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 the tax, are you going to side with the empire and then, you know, show your, and get the people mad at you? Or are you going to side with, you know, what they think is God and, and holiness and righteousness and therefore get the empire mad at you? And then that's when the Herodians come in and we can get you in trouble politically. So tr- they think they're setting up a trap because they live in this very tension between holy and unholy, righteous and unrighteous. And that coin is definitely not righteous, right? And so when they pull out the denarius, 
And it has this graven image and this phrase, the Son of God, on it. Jesus is like, well, all right, that's his. Give it to him. And give to God the things that are God's. So he makes this distinction, right? It's brilliant. And in some sense, he, in doing so, he gets very pragmatic. He's like, well, I'm not so worried about the empire. Or in this sense, I don't feel that the empire's intrusion is like, if, if they want it, let them have it. But there is another kingdom, right? Let's pay attention to that other kingdom. Unfortunately, in the West, um, we've done this divide. I mean, over the course of the centuries of the development of the church, we developed the, um, this uh, this differentiation between the sacred and the secular, right? And so in our lives, we didn't, we, we've done that separation, whereas the, the Israelites did that separation. We're the holy people of God, and those people are not the holy people of God. I mean, we had some of that, but a lot of it was also a sense of the sacred parts of our lives versus the secular parts of lives, and we became kind of divided. And so now we, a lot of people read this and like, okay, what are the things that I have to give that are part of the empire, the, the secular parts, and what are the things that I have to give that are God's? As if those are two different things. You know, and so often if you go to church, okay, the sacred is going to church. Sunday is sacred. You know, the Sabbath is sacred. And the rest of your life gets to be secular uh, at, 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 at some level. And there's this kind of division that gets set up. Um, and I think that's gotten into us, that kind of trying to differentiate sacred and secular and make these clear marks about in our lives, what's the sacred part of our lives? What's God, what are the things of God in our lives versus, you know, the things of the empires in our lives? Uh, just kind of leads to a kind of, bifurcation and um, uh, compartmentalization, and, and, and we miss how God might be active. Part of what Jesus did is he said, when he says, go ahead and love your neighbor, he says, and the people who are outside your realm of your, your immediate neighborhood, the people outside who are different than you, like the Samaritans, they're your neighbors. He says, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. I mean, all of a sudden, Jesus... Part of what he's doing is he, he breaks down that division, and that's part of what he's doing here. Give to the things that the, of the empire the things that are the emperors, and give to God the things that are God's. And, and I want to take that lead because, you know, if I think about it today, you know, you, if you look at our coins, you know, that's the thing of the empire, but what is... And, and we pay our taxes, but what do our taxes do? Our taxes provide us with roads and good health care and s good schools for our kids and, um, you know, pro a, a police force, right, and, and, and uh, safety and security. There's actually ways in which our taxes are, are benefit us and deeply benefit our lives. And to call them somehow unrighteous or unclean is that realm doesn't make sense. Like here in church, we use that, we use that same money here to support what we do. We're a nonprofit. We don't make, we don't do anything that, we, that earns money, and so we, we use that same money um, to do the things of God, to, to be the presence of God in this place, in this time. Um, so the, the, that mix, that distinction between the sacred and the secular doesn't make as much sense anymore um, for us. We live in the world. We don't believe that God, what happens, uh, that the sacred is only here in church on Sunday morning. We believe that actually the sacred, that God is found in, 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 in Mundi Park, and God is found, you know, um, in the east side of, uh, the downtown east side, that God can be encountered there, that God actually goes to the place where the sinners are at. It's not just here in church. And so there's this this widening, this broadening of scope of like the empire that actually you might find God active and alive in the empire, the kingdom of God might be there. And yet, the kingdom of God is different than the empire. And I, I think that distinction is important to maintain. But then, how do you do that? I mean, our old attempt was to say, well, some things are part of the empire and some things are part of God's, and, and we try to make this distinction, and that doesn't work. Part of the way I thought about it is, is that, well, we live in the empire. We can't help but live in the empire. And the empire is not entirely bad. Some, some parts of the empire are good. It's not a, a clear, you know, we live in a democracy. Our government is of the people, by the people, for the people. So actually the empire is us. And so we, we have to live in the empire. We live in a, in a um, market economy, uh, you know, that our, our economic lives are deeply entwined with this market economy. Um, we can't 
disentangle ourselves from it easily. You know, unless you go live off the grid and, you know, raise your own food, which some people try to do, but in reality, we can't do that. So we live in the empire. Um, and yet we're called to give to God the things that are God's. We're called to this deeper way of being. And so I think I thought of it as, as maybe our lives are permeated by empire. We live in the empire. And yet, at a much deeper level, there is the kingdom of God. And part of the spiritual journey is, and part of our, our task of following Jesus is that we actually... What are we hanging on to? Are we hanging on to that, the, the things at the level of the empire? Or are we, are, are we allowing ourselves to be pulled deeper into the kingdom of God that underlies the empire? So we're not holding on to, um, you know, we're not, our, our faith and our trust isn't so much on, on um, ourselves and, and ourselves and the things that we've made, but our faith and our trust deepens and develops into being the kingdom of God. Which is why this pull to love your neighbor, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as you love yourself, you know, pulls you deeper into the kingdom of God, to bless those who persecute you, pulls you deeper into the kingdom of God. Because in reality, all things are God's. And so, in some sense, we're giving our lives, we're making our lives a living sacrifice, um, which, which is, it means to be pulled more deeply, to allow yourself to become more deeply the person that God is creating you to be. It, it's allowing you to become more deeply, the, to, to allow yourself to flourish more deeply as the, the spiritual being that you are. It's to let yourself thrive on the good things that are part of the kingdom of God, to be grounded and rooted in the kingdom of God, and then not be swayed so much by the elements of the empire. So, um, so the spiritual task, I mean, that for me has been helpful as a way of thinking about, okay, how do I live in the world and honor the world and yet still find some sort of grounding in what I think is ultimately a deeper, deeper richer way of being? That's a lifelong process. Uh, it doesn't happen just overnight, but I mean, that is part of the spiritual journey. And it's part of the journey that we are on together. So I'm grateful to be here with you this morning. Amen.